Hi, everyone. I'm Marie Dorigny. I'm the Paris Director of the Institute for Ideas and Imagination. Um, I'm going to repeat what I said a few months ago at another presentation that medievalists have the best titles and the most exciting and unconventional research topics. And I just caught one fellow taking a screenshot of this and emailing it instantly to a previous medievalist that was at the Institute last year, just so that we keep it cool. Um, so after Ye Jung back in November, who told us about mind reading in Middle English narratives, yes, she did. This evening, Hannah Weaver is keeping the bar high with kaleidoscopic translations in the medieval West. Hannah is assistant professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia University, specializing in Western medieval European literature. She studies the shape of narratives and what those reveal about how people in the Middle Ages thought. She holds a PhD in Romance Languages from Harvard, and her book, Experimental Histories, Interpolation, and the Medieval British Past, is just out by Cornell University Press. It looks at experimental practices in medieval literature as a vehicle for social theory and reveals how people related to time and the past. Experimentations are also at the center of Hannah's current project, Latinizing the Vernacular, Retro Translation in Medieval Europe from 1200 to 1500, which digs into this strange phenomenon of translating back into Latin texts that had originally already, had already been translated in the medieval vernacular, even though the originals were still available. Hannah explores um, how these unstudied curious practices um, tell us about the vernacular and literary aesthetics. And because the Institute is also a place of experimentation, we will be doing similar uh, exercises ourselves next week, thanks to your inspiration, Hannah, and Ye Jung's initiative. And I hope we won't disappoint you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marie, for the introduction, and thank you all for coming tonight. As one of the academics among our cohort of brilliantly creative fellows, I sometimes feel like a medieval nun myself, sitting in my cell and studying dusty old volumes. Tonight, I'll emerge to share my experience so far at the Institute, which has been wonderful, and where I've been looking at a medieval story through an always shifting kaleidoscope of translations. The story goes like this. A group of 17 monks set sail on an iterative peregrination over the sea, guided by their charismatic and knowledgeable abbot, St. Brendan. Departing from Ireland, they aim to replicate a voyage made previously by a fellow monk and thereby reach the island of earthly paradise. They spend seven years on a circuit among various islands, including one that's actually the back of a huge fish, and another where the souls of the neutral angels transformed into birds offer them guidance. Finally, escaping from this circuit, they voyage further to see such wonders as sea monsters battling, a massive pillar covered in a net. It was probably an iceberg. The island where Judas has a weekly reprieve from hell, weirdly, and at last, the paradise they were seeking. It's a story by and for monks about trusting in God to see you through tough times. I'm interested in it, not because it's outlandish and compelling, though it is those things too. I'm interested in it because it is a great example of what I am calling kaleidoscopic translation, <laughs> series of translations that shift and rearrange over and over again like the crystals in a kaleidoscope. Kaleidoscopes are a 19th century invention, and I don't think medieval people had them in mind. But kaleidoscopes have a few qualities that remind me of these traditions of translation. They contain these concrete elements that get rearranged and thereby form new pictures. And to me, this recalls how content can be reconfigured by formal choices. And the relationship between the different crystals is visually unstable. They advance and recede, seeming to disappear and reappear as the optical device is manipulated. This seems to me to be a useful metaphor for the way literary works change in translation. Now, the Brendan tradition is hideously complex, as this slide shows, and you don't need to be able to read it 
The point of it is that it's horrible. Okay. And one of its complexities caught my eye. This little group over to the left, let's see. Oh, oh, okay, you'll give me this minuscule laser, but no clicking, okay. Um, <laughs> this little group over to the left with the green backgrounds. Those three green versions are back translations into Latin from a French translation of the Latin original. Put differently, a Latin text, the Navigatio Sancti Brandani, was translated into French and then translated back into Latin on three separate occasions between the mid 12th and late 14th centuries. The question is, why? Why translate this story back into Latin when Latin is supposed to be a dying language? What could Latin do that French could not? What's more, in the face of limited evidence, how can we even find answers to these questions? But let me back up. Before I can begin to approach these questions, I need to explain two things about medieval literary culture and language use. The first thing to bear in mind is that translation and rewriting are central features of medieval literary culture. Despite many proclamations of the author's death, we're still used to a literary culture that places the author at the center. We talk about books translated into many languages as a mark of success for an author. And we know that market considerations have led to many of these translations. Books are translated so that authors and publishers can reach audiences that otherwise couldn't read them. Translators working today can tell us explicitly why they think the text they're translating is worth our attention. Shout out to Ye Zheng, who pointed me in the direction of this text. A Spanish scholar of Chinese literature, Alicia Relinque, recently back translated a Chinese version of Don Quixote into Spanish. And in an interview, she explained why. We know why she did it. It was worth doing, she said, to transmit the cultural context of Lin Xu's Chinese Quixote back to the Spanish-speaking audience of Cervantes' Quixote. Any passage in any language is just so packed with information about its own culture, she said. Modern translation has made world literature possible, but it is also increasingly acknowledged that some things, words, concepts, cultures, are in fact untranslatable. Therefore, it's always desirable, we assume, to be able to read the original. Hilariously, my whole motivation for learning French in college was to be able to read Proust. Really read Proust in the Pleiad or something. Moncrief's translation simply would not do. Now things were different in the Middle Ages. Most texts are anonymous. And even when we have a name attached, we often know basically nothing about the author. In some cases, we know so little that we can't even be certain what language a work was originally written in. What's more, in the medieval period, Europe was an intensely multilingual place. People wrote and spoke French for a variety of pragmatic reasons in England, Wales, Italy, Sicily, Flanders, Germany, and the Holy Land, even as English, Welsh, Gaelic, various Italian dialects, Flemish, German, Greek, and Arabic continued to thrive. Plus, all across Europe, monks, nuns, clergy, administrators, and scholars continued to think, write, and speak in the Latin that was the official language of the Catholic Church. Given this atmosphere of multilingualism, it is perhaps unsurprising that translation was endemic in medieval literary culture. Some of the most famous works of medieval literature, things like Marie de France's Lays and Fables, this is um, a manuscript from one of the fables, or this is the, sorry, the opening of one of the fables manuscripts. Chaucer's Troilus and Crusade, Thomas Mallory's Death of King Arthur, all of these are translations. We have an old French romance that rewrites the Aeneid, a bizarre and deeply long French version of the fall of Troy, a Middle English translation of Ovid's Orpheus that has a happy ending. Translation and rewriting are essential to the development of the Western literary tradition, and often they are not between radically different cultures, unlike Lin Xu's 20th century China and Cervantes's turn of the 17th century Spain. So that's one context. 
But there's a second context that we need to keep in mind to understand that despite this medieval habit of translation, these back translations into Latin are still strikingly odd. This is the story of the rise of the vernacular and the death of Latin. Unlike me, you may not think about this story every day, but you are all familiar with its outlines. Latin is a dead language and its fatal illness occurred sometime in the misty Middle Ages. Instead of the language of the Roman Empire, Europe today speaks a variety of national languages known as vernaculars. These local tongues grew increasingly dominant as Latin grew weak, and they eventually overcame their cosmopolitan competitor. Sure, humanists like Petrarch liked to use Latin for its aesthetic benefits, and Montaigne claimed he spoke Latin before he spoke French but these late Latinists are the exceptions that prove the rule. So we've got a literary culture that's all about translation, but this tra translation usually moves away from moribund Latin into the ascendant vernacular. With this context, we've got to ask, why translate away from the vernacular into Latin when it's supposed to be dying? As I mentioned, the Navigatio Sancti Brandani was popular throughout the Middle Ages. We have 142 manuscripts of this text, which is a huge number. It doesn't sound that big, trust me. The famous Old English epic Beowulf only survives in one manuscript, to give a little bit of comparison. I've put a few of the manuscripts on the slide so you can get a sense of what some of them look like. I've tried to choose a sort of date range um, so you can get, get the vibes. The surviving manuscripts were copied between the 10th and 15th centuries all over Europe. And part of what I've been doing this year is getting a sense of this manuscript tradition and looking for clues in the manuscripts and the translations about what made this text worth copying and recopying, translating and retranslating. What I found so far is that the answer pulls in two directions. On one end is Walter of Châtillon, a Latin poet best known for his epic on Alexander the Great. Walter turns the Brendan story into a poem worthy of vying for prestige with the ancients, including Virgil and Ovid. On the other end are the two prose back translations, which, as I will show, exploit Latin's unexpected vernacular qualities. As I explain these findings, I'll touch on the reasons why each version was created and what each translator finds possible in Latin. But before we can get to the Latin back, tra back translations, it's worth looking briefly at the French text they were working from to see what claims it stakes for its status as a vernacular translation. Benedict's Voyage de Saint-Brendan is the best known of all the adaptations of the Navigatio. Benedict follows the Navigatio fairly closely, though he does rearrange and abridge episodes to make a more coherent story. And this text is important in literary history because it's one of the first texts that we have written down in octosyllabic rhymed couplets which, I mean, may sound dull, but it was actually the form that would be used by Francophone romancier historians and hagiographies for centuries. It was the dominant form for narrative, and this is one of our earliest witnesses. So um, it's been studied for that reason a fair amount. Benedict begins his text with a salutation to Henry I's queen, his patron, praising her for her Christianity and peace weaving. He names himself, he gives his name, Benedates, which is how we know who wrote it, and then he introduces the work at hand. Here's what he writes. What you have commanded, he has undertaken. According to his understanding, has put it into letters. Put it into letters and into French, as was your command, the story of St. Brendan, the good abbot. In these lines, a chiasmus or repetition in reverse, centers around the idea of command and writing through the obscure figure of the lettre. I've color coded it on the slide so you can see the repeated elements um, in, in their colors, even if you can't read Old French. The repetition of en lettre mi plus its position at the center of the chiasm suggests that something en lettre seems to be essential to Benedict. But what does en lettre mean? Some have argued that, in opposition to romance, lettre should be understood as Latin. So this would mean that Benedict would have written two separate versions of this text, one in romance, French, and another one in lettre, 
Latin. Okay. It could also simply mean writing, like he wrote it down as opposed to said it out loud. And as a final, more speculative possibility, it also seems plausible that lettre may be a formal designation referring to the second translation Benedate makes from prose to verse. So his source, the Navigatio Sancti Brandani, is in some pretty humble Latin prose. It's not rhetorically sophisticated. It's not interested in doing much seemingly other than transmitting the story and telling us some about the characters involved. Um, Benedict, on the other hand, writes a highly sophisticated poem. So he's translating from prose to verse in addition to translating from Latin to French. And I think that the highly poetic doubling of En Lettre Mi reinforces the possibility that it may be referring to the transition from prose to verse. It's situated in the second half of the line at its first introduction, and the first half of the next line in its second iteration. So it calls attention to the subunits, the half lines, the hemistitches of the octosyllabic form, and the crux of the chiasmus at the same time. En lettre mi, in other words, renders the poetry making process visible. Now, in the chiasmus, sense and language are the only two aspects not repeated in the sequence. And because of this commonality, they seem to reflect on one another. Understanding and language are connected by their position in the chiastic pattern and their off rhyme in French, it's sens and romance. So here's a, here's a little diagram. Um, so we go from the command to the execution of, a, of the command to the understanding, which is something that's not ref reflected again. Lettre, lettre, and language. So understanding and language are paired because of their position. And the overall effect here is one of working and reworking. These four lines dramatize the labor of translation. The four central aspects of the chiasm circle around the transmission of understanding through lettre and romance. After the tight enclosure of the chiasmus, the topic of the work presented in the next line feels like it stands in isolation. It's in white here because it doesn't actually track onto the chiasmus. And this impression grows since it is the first line of a couplet on a new rhyme. It's not uh, related to the others in terms of its rhyme either. So overall, where, where are we? Benedict's preface demonstrates an interest in poetic play and a consciousness of the text's position in a multilingual literary discourse. He seems very conscious of what French can do and its position in the early 12th century multilingual landscape. He name drops his patron, right? He's really invested in the fact that his patron told him, hey, she said, write this in French for me. I need it in French. So these royal connections raise the status of French. But at the same time, his anxious mentioning of his patron shows some consciousness that its status needs to be raised, that it's a, it's a, it's a weird choice to write in French at this point, and kind of um, a lo possibly read as a low status choice, so he's got to boost it. And interesting side note, by 1267 in Picardie, a copy was made of this text that deletes the prologue. So maybe by 1267, there was no need to be like, I had to write in French because she told me to, right? Mm -hmm. um, he also seems to really harp on the fact that tr French can transmit his understanding of the material. French can mean something. And that French can be highly poetic. Obviously, those two statements seem ridiculous from our point of view. Of course, French can be poetic. Of course, French can mean something. But again, these are some of the earliest days of written French, and he's writing in a form that was really new at the time. And so he, he had felt the need to make these claims, really, um, things that feel uh, just that they go without saying to us did not go without saying to him. So that's where we're starting, right? He's making this French translation um, and feeling the need to sort of anxiously explain why he's putting it into French. At the same time, he's writing French in 1118. That's an early form of Old French, just in terms of linguistic history. So it's possible that his Old French became sort of outdated and difficult to read as time went on. Um, so we get into a situation where perhaps this French that was so new is now feeling quite old. 
Under this circumstance, let's now turn to the Latin uh, back translations. Let's start with Walter of Chatillon's verse back translation. What does he do with Benedict's poetic French? Walter's poem was written within 50 years of Benedict's French translation and survives in just one manuscript. He had access both to Benedict's translation and to the Latin Navigatio. So here's a situation where Guy definitely knew that this text already existed in Latin because he looked at it, right? He refers to it explicitly. To figure out his attitude towards Latin and his reasons for translating from French to Latin and in the case of his Latin source from prose to verse, we don't have correspondence, diary entries, or a translator's preface. There are no interviews published in The Guardian for us to consult. All we have is the poem itself. So I now want to take a close look at some key moments to see what we can learn from the poem about Walter's goal in making his Latin back translation. Why did he do it? Walter opens his poem with a nine stanza prologue. This prologue establishes his poetic commitments and delineates his intervention as he saw it into literary history. From the very first lines, Walter seeks to distinguish his work from that of his empty classical predecessors, both in form and content. I'm not gonna torture you by reading in Latin all night, but this particular passage, uh, it's important to hear the sounds, so I will read in Latin. Um, Vana vanis gariat pagina pagana, greges agros prelia vox virgiliana, munde directoribus placeant mundana, Alexandre studia pia sint non vana. So that means the vain pagan page chatters about vain things. The Virgilian voice chatters about flocks, fields, battles. Let worldly things please lovers of the world. Let the enthusiasms of Alexander be pious, not vain. This hirsute opening bristles with rhetorical figures and wordplay. In addition to the obvious alliteration and repetition of words in different inflections, which is a rhetorical figure known as polyptaton, the poet also restricts the vowel sounds in the first line to a ah and e, creating assonance across the line. These same sounds show up in the critical word pia, which means pious, in line four, which is really the punchline of the preceding development that figures piety as a direct rebuttal to the emptiness of pagan pages. In a deft irony, the repetitions, the assonance, creates exactly the chatty effect that Walter rails against here. In the second line, the pithy dismissal of Virgil's of with three nouns in opposition, flocks, fields, battles, that's quite the way to sum up the Aeneid and the Eclogues, um, shows just how empty the disdainful poet thinks they are. The four rhyme words of the stanza, pagan, virgilian, worldly, and vain, emphasize the theme of empty worldliness, further underlined by the repetition of vana, empty or vain, as the first and last word of the stanza. Immediately, Walter carves out a poetic space for himself and Alexander away from pagan chatter. There is a pious voice available, he suggests, that is distinct from the Latin of Rome. At two points in the prologue, the poet refers to his process as a translator. In the first instance, he introduces his topic with a volley of alliterative S's, drawing attention through hissing sibilance to his story's hidden aspects. The succession of secrets which, by singular luck, Brendan deserved to probe abroad, I dared before the rest to speak forth in meter. That I can do such things with such daring astonishes me. The act of translation here is characterized as one from history to meter, of hidden things to their exposition. Brendan's lived experience is less important than their exposition by a particularly audacious poet. Later in the preface, the poet returns to the definition of his task. As he ordered, he being his patron, Pope Alexander, I explain these things in poetic fashion. Translating in this fashion from a vernacular poem, I renew ancient writing while I sing these new things. Thus, writing about Brendan, antiquity sings forth. 
Walter begins the stanza by explaining that he executes the will of Pope Alexander, who seems to have ordered his poet to write in verse, kind of like uh, Henry I queen o ordered Benedict to write in French. He then talks about what the patron commanded him to do. Walter names two species of activity with the verb transferens, which means to carry across, and renovo, renew. Transferens comes from the same verb that gives us translation, suggesting that it might describe the movement from one language to another. This connection is reinforced by the fact that the poet sees himself transferens ritmo de romano, translating from a vernacular poem, which is the only clear mention of language in the preface. The vernacular poem seems to be the same as the new things that the poet sings. Renovo, on the other hand, suggests a rejuvenating power. It is through translation that the poet is able to renew old writing at the same time as he sings the new things taken from French. As I mentioned earlier, Walter also consulted the Latin Navigatio, though he doesn't mention it in his prologue. It becomes clear later when he reinserts a frankly pretty boring episode that his French source had perhaps rightly deleted, declaring that in the copy of the Latin text at this place, a chapter of serious matter is interwoven, having chosen its place in the narrative. I am asked by the pious to make this thing known in meter. So this is an interesting statement, right? Where there's an implied audience that knows the Brendan story so well that they're like, where's this boring thing that you left out? And he has yeah. to come back and add it uh, back in. So he's compiling the two sources on the request of these pious people, presumably including his patron. And the, the motivations for this are meter and seriousness, right? So he's asked to include it in meter. Now, it is worth noting that despite his stated disdain for pagan chatter, Walter also turns to Virgil, Ovid, and other Roman authorities as poetic sources, a particularly rich example of Walter's reliance on classical diction rather than more straightforward translation of Benedict comes in the episode when the monks come across two sea serpents in a fearsome battle, that classic episode. Um, departing from his French source, Walter renders the sea serpent into a Medusa-like threat. To look at it means ruin. He continues in a densely elusive mode. The hideous heat of its panting breath and its gaping mouth, the foul fence of its teeth, the thundering voice, I am unable to express what terror they arouse, how the abbot's company faints, faints at their sight. Scholars have found a number of references here. Iatus oris, gaping mouth, might refer to the wolf's head worn by the female warrior Camilla uh, in her, uh, her opponent during her Aristia or death scene in, the, in Aeneid 11. The collocation on one line of alitus and oris might recall several uses of angelitus <coughs> oris in Ovid. The fence of the teeth, a Homeric image as we all surely recognized, was likely called from references to Homer and Aulus Gellius or Apuleius because uh, the Greek Homer was not available in the medieval West. Where his French source made a homely comparison to the familiar flames of a furnace to describe the, the sea serpent's mouth, Walter instead rendered the monster less familiar to most audiences through his classical citations. He writes for an in-crowd of the learned who had read enough Roman literature to catch his references. So what have we learned from these close readings, which again is all we've got, about Walter's reasons for making a Latin back translation? Walter positions his Latin translation as a rupture with Roman literary traditions, though he in fact draws on them extensively, and as a renewal. Rupture and renewal. In other words, modernization. For him, the transformation into meter seems every bit as important as the transfer across languages. Meter is a daring choice befitting serious topics. Latin is useful for his poetic endeavor because of the aesthetic capacities of an inflected language, which he thoroughly exploits. Aesthetics are important to him 
and his Latin differs from, but competes with and absorbs Ovid and Virgil. He insists that Latin can sing through humble stories like Brendan's. He argues that his metrical and rhymed Latin verse is modern, daring, serious, and beautiful. So much for one end of our back translation spectrum. Let's pass now to the other end. In this part, I'll examine the two prose retro translations of Benedict's voyage, whose manuscripts are connected to Cistercian houses from opposite ends of Europe, via Crucis in the Wel Welsh marches and Alcobasa in Portugal. Though both follow their old French source poem closely, they are not related. These two houses are coincidentally both very interesting in terms of literary history, which I'd be happy to discuss further in questions if anyone is interested. But for now, let's remember briefly who the Cistercians are. The Cistercian order is a monastic reform movement that splintered from a Benedictine abbey in Molem near Dijon in 1098. They sought a greater adherence to the rule of St. Benedict, which is a sort of a compendium of how to behave that formed the backbone of monastic life. Their austere and principled approach had broad appeal. By 1152, so a mere 54 years after this splintering, there were 333 <coughs> Cistercian abbeys across Europe. I've put a picture of one of the most beautiful ones, Sénonc in Provence on the screen. Perhaps you have been there to see the lavender. Why would two different Cistercian houses own back translations of Brendan's adventures? It seems Cistercians used the Brendan story as a source of Lexio Divina, or divine reading, which might partially account for the retro, retro translations. Lexio Divina was one of the aspects of the rule of St. Benedict that the Cistercians wanted most to reinvigorate. A core group of works for the Lexio Divina includes the Cistercian Book of Usages, the Antiphonary, Gregory the Great's Dialogues, and most importantly for us, something called the Lives of the Fathers, which is a compendium of stories about ancient saints, essentially the saintly fathers of the church. A manuscript of the original Navigatio, once owned by Clairvaux, which is perhaps the most famous Cistercian monastery, has division into lecciones, in other words, it's like, this is how much you should read at a time. That's what a division into a lexio is. It's a reading passage, um, which tells us that this might have been read out loud at refectory while the monks were eating. So there would have been someone, because they ate in silence, obviously. So um, they, were, they were silently eating, and someone would have been reading something um, edifying to them. And this manuscript, with its little uh, red mark that says lexio, is telling us how it could have been divvied up for these readings at Clairvaux, presumably. Um, so in other words, this story, which is related to the lives of the fathers in that it's a story of a saintly and ancient man, um, might have been integrated into Cistercian practice as part of this divine reading. There's one more detail to add about Cistercian Lexio Divina. Cistercians were supposed to be savoring these readings exclusively in Latin. The general chapter of 1200, the general chapter is an annual meeting of Cistercian leaders, ordered abbots to burn copies of the Song of Songs translated into French, along with any other books of that sort, presumably translations into French or other vernaculars. One version of this document goes so far as to say that, quote, abbots should burn books translated into romance or vernaculars whenever they find them in their houses. Now, of course, any prohibition bears witness to the fact that the opposite was happening. Cistercians must have had a vernacular book problem for the chapter to insist on the use of Latin. Nevertheless, it's possible to see this prohibition as one answer to why these Latin back translations were made in the first place. Perhaps a particularly rule-abiding abbot heard this proclamation and was like, oh shoot, we only have it in French, let's uh, fix this, right? Okay, but if you'll forgive me, I have to go into the weeds for just a second. I, you're like, you've been there already. Okay, um, but, uh, okay. Let me just, there, we've got a problem in, in terms of the research and I just wanna be honest with you about it. Um, this Cistercian stuff is actually one of the places 
where things are tricky because we have the Navigatio, this huge tra uh, tradition. We don't know exactly which version Benedict translated, but there are enough that are similar that no one's really too fussed about that. Benedict clearly translated the Navigatio into French. Then the trouble is what we've got surviving, are, I'm sorry, I'll just yell, are these two, which are both copies of some other lost and pr presumably irrecoverable manuscript. So we know that these two copies were owned by Cistercian houses, presumably used by Cistercian houses, but we don't know if the intermediate level were in fact made by Cistercians because we don't have them to look at them and know if we, there are any marks of where they were made or any evidence of, of who owned them. So we've got a little bit of a problem. So what I'm, what I'm going to try to do now is uh, show you how I've, I think I've, con I, think, I think the answer is yes, to made by Cistercians, yes, I think. And so I'm gonna to try to show you why I think the answer is yes. Okay, I think this is where we have to look really closely at the translations. An interest in promoting Brendan for Lexio Divina in the prose retro translation, this one, the later one, I think solidifies its Cistercian provenance. This translation adds prefatory material that suggests that the Brendan story may have garnered a certain amount of skepticism by the 14th century, but that it was still worth studying. Here begins the life of St. Brendan the Abbot. As we have confirmed from the statements of those whose purpose was not to lie, and as we have found written in history books, in the time of our fathers, there was a certain man, Brendan by name, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So using the conventional first person plural to mark the narrator's voice, this version touts the veracity of its sources, both oral and written. The reduplication of authority in the first few clauses, we've got the people who aren't lying and the writing and the history books, right? That seems a little anxious, it's a little much. Um, and this, this sort of overworking of where the sources came from might be caused by the fantastical elements of the story. Um, side note, there exists from around this same time a satirical poem making fun of the Brendan story and of anyone who would believe in it because it's clearly so preposterous. Mm -hmm. So in other words, by this time, people were bothering to write down critiques of this story. It wasn't just swallowed hook, line, and sinker. Um, and in the next clause, the redactor, after saying, listen, these are trustworthy sources of many kinds, he connects Brendan to the Holy Fathers by asserting that he lived in their time. So we can read this as another truth claim, one based in connecting in constructing an accurate connection between human lives and the passing ages. If we can place someone on a timeline, that makes them feel more real. Cistercian concerns might furnish a way to think about this anxious response. In three terse clauses, this preface manages to refer to two of the main sources of Lexio Divina attested in Cistercian houses, histories and the lives of the fathers. By tying Brendan's story securely to both, the brief prologue of the Alcobasa version promotes it as a candidate for Lexio Divina. So I'm gonna go ahead and I think this is enough to say that the retro translation could at least have been plausibly made for a Cistercian audience. But is utility for Cistercian Lexio Divina the only reason that these translators turned back to Latin? The Valle Crucis retro translation suggests that there's more going on. Here we have the first page of this manuscript and at the top, you can see that it says Liber de Marie de Valle Crucis. So it's telling you that it was copied um, in Valle Crucis and that handwriting is from the first half of the 13th century. And this copy is also from the second quarter of the 13th century. So most likely it was in this library either immediately, like it was copied in that monastery or very soon after when it was copied. So we can't be sure um, that the translation uh, was Cistercian, the whole missing link thing. Oh, it's working. Oh, oh, oh. okay. So we're, we're trying to figure out if this, if this was also Cistercian, but we know, we know for sure that this copy was like made and used in the Cistercian monastery. So 
Unlike Walter's preface, this preface does not name its sources, talk about its form, or refer explicitly to its status as a translation. The prologue of the Valle Crucis copy makes two intriguing moves, however. First, it establishes the need to transmit holy deeds because of their exemplarity, which in itself is not terribly surprising and chimes with the use of the text for Lectio Divina, you should try to follow the examples of the saints if you're a monk. But the way it phrases this topos suggests that the text co-ops its French source in order to distinguish itself from it. Okay, so the first move it's making is distinguishing it itself from French. And the second thing that it does is I think it posits a certain kind of vernacularity for Latin. So the first thing, distinguishing Latin from French. The prologue begins with the obligation to transmit information about the past. Let not the holy deeds of our predecessors be silenced, since once heard by wise men and delivered to the recollection of mind and speech, they cut away both faults and egregious acts, and leaving to each person the things that belong to them rightly to do, they offer the greatest suitability. I'm really interested in this verb, takeantur. This, is, this verb means be silenced. And I think it's interesting because it suggests that its French source somehow did silence the holy deeds, right? Let them not be silenced by being in French. Let them be loud by being in Latin. The Latin text depicts itself as speaking out against the silencing and being the most apt vehicle to transmit the holy deeds of the wise men and their memory. So it's sketching out an audience of the wise and positioning itself as an agent of non-silence. As the preface continues, the word facilius more easily hints that something about this redaction makes the story more readily available. So that's uh, here. An example might be made available more readily to listeners, right? Um, now, greater facility in accessing information, particularly um, out loud, is a quality more usually associated with the vernacular or mother tongues, right? That's supposed to be an easier language for us all to understand than learned languages. It seems, however, that this translator finds a vernacular ease in Latin compared to the implied difficulty of his French source. It seems that this translator thinks that Latin will facilitate transmission for his audience, suggesting, however sketchily, that there's some kind of vernacular valence here. He swiftly follows this assertion of openness with a citation to Luke 11.9, which is the second thing in yellow here. This is surely one of the greatest hits of the New Testament. Seek and you shall find, knock and it shall open to you. The citation instantiates the opening to which it refers. Seek within the storehouse of Latin, it implies, and you shall find an appropriate citation. Knock on the door of exemplarity, and it shall open onto the Bible. The seeker, the knocker, are welcomed into the lessons of Brendan's fantastical journey through the open door of the Vulgate. This is something Latin can do better than French, according to the translator of the Valle Crucis translation. It can serve as a container for biblical and patristic citation. This Latin retro translation provides further examples of the citational vernacular in episodes it adds to its French source. Coincidentally, some of these amplifications come in the same episode that Walter had classicized, the fight between sea monsters witnessed by the shipful of monks. The first of Brendan's exhortations during the fight couches the monk's understandable fear as a lamentable distraction from prayer. Not just a rational response to a fire-breathing monster, fear and its desired opposite, fearlessness, is also an intertextual clue that more securely anchors this translation to a Cistercian milieu, since it borrows phrases and lexicons from stalwarts of monastic theology. Look out, lest your purpose be consumed by fear in such a way that it becomes divided from the prayers that should be pouring forth and when you are astray from the correct path, that the support of God be denied. Lift up your hearts, and with fear cast aside, trust in the comfort of God. Brendan, who's speaking to his monks, ventriloquizes other voices here. Most subtly, he uses some of Bernard of Clairvaux's preferred vocabulary. Bernard of Clairvaux, heavy hitter of the Cistercian order, 
Bernard's lexicon of fear, often couched as a positive state of fear in God, is astonishingly prevalent in his work. Occurrences of forms of timor, which is one word that means fear in Latin, that word alone occurs more than 660 times in his surviving work, according to a search of the Library of Latin Texts, while his preferred terms for boldness or lack of fear, temerius and securus, appear some 550 times. So he's clearly just talking about fear nonstop. Here, Brendan urges his monks to lay aside their fear of the monsters and replace it with hope in God. This is a very Bernardian sentiment. Also, Brendan Bernard, it's a real tongue twister. Mm. Um, Enrique Te Corda Vestra is a more direct citation to Augustine, who uses it several times in his work. Brendan's second expanded monologue in this episode, same episode, Sea Monsters, etc., speeds up the rhythm of citations, sampling from Paul, Bernard of Clairvaux again, and the Psalms. And then Brendan said to his fellows, we have been dressed in the breastplate of faith and armed with hope, strengthened with love, love the Lord above all things, and serve him in fear. The translator first places a common image of spiritual armor in Brendan's mouth. The Pauline idea of armor as a metaphor for faith, hope, charity, and other Christian values had been developed in 1 Thessalonians and Ephesians. The language here is closer to 1 Thessalonians. By the turn of the 13th century, this rhetoric had been mobilized and literalized in the discourse of the Crusades. The loudest, or at least most famous, voice in this transference of the allegorical to the literal was, once again, oh, no, Bernard of Clairvaux. In his treatise in support of the newly created Knights Templar at the beginning of the Second Crusade, Bernard encouraged recruits to the fighting order to be dressed in the breastplate of faith. Brendan's speeches expand to include citation. Latin allows for easy channeling of biblical and patristic voices. Faced with an implausible battle of marine titans, the translator rummages through his storehouse of Latin literature and comes up with words and phrases whose very familiarity is their virtue. Particularly in a monastic context, Latin could do this better than French, which might explain why the Via Crucis retro translation brims with citation. For its Cistercian audience, this overtly Christian account of the travels of a saint benefited from a little extra authorization from the Vulgate and Bernard of Clairvaux. I hope I've convinced you, by way of copious citations to Cistercian touchstones, that the lost original of this one was probably also Cistercian. So, what have the Cistercian retro translations told us about their attitude toward Latin and their perception of its capacities? First of all, Latin is supposedly more appropriate for Lexio Divina, a link that the Alcobasa translation reinforces in its preface. But there are more surprising contentions in the Valle Crucis manuscript, which posits that Latin is a way to overcome the silencing of French, and that Latin provides an ease we might more typically associate with a mother tongue. It also shows that Latin can effortlessly, effortlessly absorb biblical and patristic citations. For the redactor of the Valle Crucis retro translation, Latin is a pious storehouse for the religious vernacular. So to conclude, I have proposed that back translations in the Brendan tradition urge us to look again at the familiar story of the rise of the vernacular and the death of Latin. Latin was a site of modern renovation in Walter of Chatillon's poem and of vernacular utility in the Cistercian prose translations. The retranslations between Latin and French, between prose and verse, show us a dynamic scene of competing priorities and assertions, hardly a situation in which Latin is emitting its death rattle, nor one in which the vernacular automatically connotes accessibility. Looking through the kaleidoscope at the Brendan tradition, we spy an unfamiliar configuration of language use that counters many of our dominant narratives. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, um, my name is Ashley. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Uh, I have two questions. The first one's about like, what is the size of like the total corpus of retro translations from not just French, but like, you know, maybe other romance ver language vernaculars into, yeah, because I, <laughs> I missed the first part of the, of the talk. So maybe no, you no, talk about you that. It wasn't answered. So this is, uh, thank you. You've, you're teeing me up. Continue. Wonderful. And there's a side <laughs> question to that, which is that like, because you give this example from Lin Shu, right? Yeah. Like, are there any examples of Chinese back translations into Latin, not into Spanish, but into Latin. Ooh, to the second one, yeah. not that I know of, mm -hmm. um, and it would really surprise me. So if anyone does know of that, I would love to hear about it, but I, I, no. So that one's not that I know of. That's an easy one. But the corpus, the larger corpus of uh, Latin through vernacular back into Latin retro translations is um, represented on this slide. Um, so the, the answer, I, I'm not going to read all of these to you because we don't need to, but the answer is basically that it is not a massive phenomenon, but it is also not a negligible phenomenon. Like some of these, um, the matter of Troy one and the Jeffrey of Monmouth one have lots and lots of copies made that, and, and become very popular. Um, or in the case of Jeffrey of Monmouth, there are lots of copies and they're all kind of different. It's very unruly. It's very hard to get a handle on. And so um, those two are, are really, really significant. And the fact that there are these three separate ones in the Brendan tradition, even though none of the three have a huge manuscript tradition associated with them, the fact that that happened on three separate occasions is, I think, also significant and that it happened over such a long period of time. So um, I'm also, though, I'm also interested in things that go from French to Latin to French, or things that go from verse to prose to verse, or prose to verse to prose. I'm just interested in this. As I've been here, my project has shifted and been less, less hyper-focused on Latin to blank to Latin, and more on the back and forth movement uh, more broadly. Thank you. And then just a quick, qu uh, no, the second question sure. actually, it's about vernacularity because yeah. you mentioned that you, you came out with this really interesting point at the, towards the end about how Latin was actually maybe more vernacular than people thought or yeah. than people think, right? Yeah. So then how do we explain why no modern day Latin speaking communities still exist, maybe beyond the Vatican City? And, yeah. and why did most people adopt the vulgar version or the vernacular version of Latin then? Thank you. I think that's, that's a great question. I think that um, at the end of the day, Latin is super complicated and uh, not super intuitive language. Um, what I'm trying to suggest is not that Latin, the vernac in a sense, the rise of the vernacular story is a true story because we're not all wandering around speaking Latin. It's a true story. I guess what I'm trying to do is not refute that story, but rather say that it wasn't just a straightforward teleology. Like, of course, everyone was going to end up speaking the vernacular. It's so much more expressive or better or clearer or however you want to you know whatever positive attribute you want to give it and rather say that it, it wasn't a linear a linear progression and that in certain sub communities latin just like in vatican city uh may have had a, a sort of tenacious afterlife and a and a and share some qualities of the vernacular that have not been historically attributed to it. Now, another scholar, Chris Cannon, has already argued um, previously that in terms of learning to read, Latin may have often been the sort of mother tongue of reading, because even if you went on to read in many different languages, you often had your reading instruction in the Middle Ages in Latin. So that's our people are already complicating the story. I'm not the first one, but uh, I think that this the back translations give us another data set to to consider. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Anna. Thank you so. On. Okay. It's on. Yeah. Thank you so much for that talk. This was so interesting. Um, and I hope I'm, that's not because I'm a medievalist in the room. <laughs> um, I think it was interesting for anyone. Um, my question is, uh, you can say no, I haven't looked into it, but I'm just curious about the, the vernacular traditions of the Brendan story and if those versions come with like a rationale for putting the Latin into the vernacular that could be maybe like usefully played off of the kind of Back to Latin rationales. It, have you looked into that at all? I think that'd be interesting. 
Uh, thank you. That's a that's a also a good question. I um I have looked, but not in depth. And some of these I have not looked at. So the other one that is a really significant and interesting tradition is this Dutch tradition. It's a very transformative. Like a, a question maybe for tomorrow is like what counts as a translation and what counts as an adaptation. Some would consider this to be an adaptation more than a translation. Um, and so. I, I have read it in English translation. I don't have Dutch. Um, and I don't remember there being things jumping out at me about its justification for being translated. Um, Benedict is, I think, ex extra explicit and extra defensive because he's so precocious. Whereas here, we, we've got some lost Middle Dutch version and then these other, so it, it, it's not nearly as early in the history of writing down the vernacular. So I would predict, and I, since I don't recall anything particularly interesting, I also would think that it's maybe less explicit about its choice. That's a good question. And now I'll have to look before our conversation tomorrow. I, I, th the first is just more of a comment and, um, and it will lead into a question, but some of this made me think of the, the story of the, the, the Thousand and One Nights. And yes, how, yeah. How it's, it's, it's a similar kind of, mm. I, d I don't know if there are actually back translations, but there is a similar sort of palimpsest of, mm -hmm. of, of bits and pieces of, of, of different language, different translations, different languages. And then there's, of course, Galland's sort of mm, reinvention in a way, mm -hmm. right? Sort of retroactively, mm -hmm. the, the Europeans come in and, and, and reinvent the tradition mm -hmm. as, as an exotic tradition. So, I don't know if that's something that you've looked into and if, there's, if, there, if it's worth exploring. Mm. Um, but it leads me to a, a question, which is in a way, I think, a, a reformulation of the second question before um, from the back here about the politics of mm. this. Now, you, you're very, and I see, the, I see the medievalist sticking to the internalist analysis of the texts and the formalism, and mm. it's, it's brilliant. I wish I could color code um, my texts like that. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, um, when I teach this stuff, it's a fairly simple, quick and dirty story of the French state is emerging and language and sort of the, the vernacular French language mm -hmm. is a way of sort of uh, wrestling power uh, away from the church, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. that, that, so what's, what's your version of this? It kind of comes a little bit at the end in your talk with the Crusades, but, yeah. but is there a, what, what would an externalist quick and dirty sort of um, analysis have to say about why this need for, yeah. for, for Latin back translation? Well, um, you may have noticed me bristle a little bit when you talked about French as like a nationalist uh, impulse and that I, 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 I twitched because um, French was actually such a, it was, I mean, that's what lingua franca means, right, as actually French language, um, because it was such an international language in the Middle Ages and, and was used so, so widely. And so actually French is the direct, I think, although my slide that I can't get back to quickly enough shows that this happened through other languages, French is really the direct competitor of Latin in terms of being a super local, potentially cosmopolitan language in the Middle Ages. So what would the quick and dirty version be? Um, I, I, I'm wary of giving this version. I have a version. I'm going to say it. But I'm, I'm hesitating because I, I feel like it plays into some assumptions or it'll sound like some familiar assumptions but i think it's actually more interesting than those assumptions so i think the the, the quick and dirty version is that um in clerical and monastic milieu that's where latin had vernacular resonance and 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 thrived for longer that doesn't sound particularly surprising but i guess i what i what i'm thinking is more surprising here are, are the ways in which Latin was not just lingering as a relic, but was rather a striking evidence of modernity for one poet, and was it's sort of a living repository. Almost, I'm thinking actually, Masha, of your talk in this, the um, storage containers and the storerooms of, of uh, sort of visiting the storeroom of Anne Lister, but you could visit the storehouse of Latin and, and pull something back out into your house, just like we can go to the storage container and get out a chest of drawers that we had left there. So I, I guess I feel like it's a much more um, vibrant thing 
And I think we have a tendency from a 21st century, largely secular perspective to think that anything that was happening in monasteries was like automatically dusty and, and backwards looking, but that's not, that's just not the case in the middle ages. So I hope that was enough of a, uh, I don't know, a, a that's fine. That's simple fine. statement. <laughs> yeah. I lost my train of thought. Sorry. Thank you very much, Hannah. That was fascinating for the non-medievalist. And um, I was wondering about this, uh, the value of originalism. Is mm. in, in, in all of this, sort of the, the, the translations, the back translations, the copies, mm -hmm. is there sort of this, this fetishism of the original or of a better copy or of mm. a better translation? Are, are different Cistercian, uh, Cistercian monasteries sort of wishing that they could borrow the copy of another one because it's supposedly better or is this or is there not this sort of idea of an original better text i love this question this is like a question about the history of philology um so we if you'll excuse me while i back way up for a second we know that even in the library of alexandria textual criticism was happening and um, people did perceive that some sections or lines of different uh, canonical works might have been spurious and would mark them for deletion in further copies. So there is an awareness uh, of long standing that some texts are better than others. That being said, I don't think there was nearly the fetishization of the original of like getting back to this sort of Ur text. It was more of a detection of clear moments of something having gone awry. Like things can. It happens to all of us, right? Have you ever been copying something by hand and you write the same word twice? It's, it's got a name, it's called a dittography. Um, so it, it's happened to all of us. And so things can get garbled just, and, and there was a recognition that things could get garbled and a desire to undo the garbling, but that's different from thinking there's some pristine original that we must strive for. Um, so this whole, the huge mutability of medieval textuality is really unfamiliar to us, I think. Um, it's really, it requires like, I honestly feel like I have to fight against my lifelong assumptions as someone that lives in the 21st century constantly um, because it, it just, everything about literary culture is not, all the assumptions that we have, many of them don't hold. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, it was wonderful. Uh, wonderful. And uh, my question is sort of seconding Eric's, but the subject is really fascinating. And uh, my question is addressing the liberty a translator or a, well, a person mm. who is, well, taking the text, carrying the text forward. Mm -hmm. What kind of liberty he or she could be taking? Mm -hmm. And uh, how conscious the, the notion of well, being free with the text, mm. um, how conscious it could be. Because in my mind, and uh, again, I'm quite far from, uh, well, being a medieval a medievalist, mm. but I have this uh, picture of uh, a certain body of sacred texts mm -hmm. that are, that you are supposed to be treating really seriously, mm -hmm. the translations, the corrections, the, the never ending questioning when it comes to every single letter in mm -hmm. the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, the evolving tradition of folklore mm -hmm. with fairy tales and songs and whatever else that is wandering and uh, self-changing by definition. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, somewhere in between, between the mm -hmm. sacred and uh, and uh, mm, uh, mm, secular, let's say. Uh, uh, what are wh what exactly you could be doing? And uh, mm -hmm. if you wanted to translate something from Latin to French, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, how much of a change you could allow yourself to to to, to, to and the text you're working at? Mm -hmm. 
You all have the best questions. This has been so fun. This is such a good question, and I have so much to say, but I'll try to um, restrain myself. First of all, in terms of the question of fidelity, I mean, one of the earliest interventions in translation theory that we still all have to slog through in the translation study readers or whatever is Jerome, who wrote when he was translating the, the Vulgate Bible, um, that he strove for sense-for-sense sense translation rather than word-for-word, word, that he felt that that was um, a, a better way to go about translating. So that's a certain amount of freedom already compared to, to word for word. Um, but how free did they feel they could be? I love these two poles that you've outlined between sort of holy writ, where we, we imagine it being hyper-faithful, although actually the Bible was interpolated and messed with quite a lot over, over the histories and, or over the centuries, and it wasn't um, canonized and fixed until surprisingly late uh, by our from our perspective um, so but nevertheless ultimately it was more fixed and I agree with that sort of basic outline and the other side of folklore which is truly kaleidoscopic um, if we're going to use my key term uh, they definitely I would say uh, leaned folklore uh, versus leaned uh, sacred text so I'm just going to tell you the story of one of my favorite uh, examples and then uh, perhaps perhaps it will be of interest so, like I mentioned briefly, they didn't have the Greek Homer in the medieval West. It survived in the medieval East, in the in the Greek-speaking world, and that's how we have it today. But in the medieval West, there was no transmission of it whatsoever. And they weren't fussed about this because Homer was a liar. And they knew he was a liar because he hadn't been an eyewitness to the fall of Troy. Um, on the other hand, two accounts in Latin, which you would think would already ring some alarm bells, but two accounts in Latin survived putatively by eyewitnesses, one on the Greek side and one on the Trojan side. So what they actually are are late antique Latin epitomes of Homer back when there was access between the Greek and the Latin. Um, but in the Middle Ages, they were treated as sort of very authoritative because it was like a real Greek who was there and like a real, tro anyway, very silly um, from our perspective. Um, but there's this, I mentioned it, this insane, incredibly long, it's something like 35,000 verses in French, deeply long, so wildly dry um, <laughs> account of the Trojan War that comes from these Latin epitomes, which are very short, on the other hand. So we have the Iliad is somewhere in between, right? Like the actual account of the actual part of the fall of Troy is much, uh, is sort of self-contained. We have this really short thing, and then we have this insane, baggy, long-winded, like digressions on sort of automata, like you can't even imagine what it, what is in it. Um, and so, but he claimed that he was translating very faithfully. <laughs> so um, just as we too read some um, accounts of found documents and sort of, uh, I mean, Cervantes, to bring back another name from our from this presentation, was the king of this, right? But the same sort of maneuvers were made even in the 12th century. Yeah. Following Maria's question and your answer, I was going to ask you if you could tell us about any more inst instances of translation being used as a, as a pretext for fiction. Uh, mm -hmm. Don Quixote mm -hmm. is famously a book found by Cervantes in a market, mm -hmm. originally written in Arabic mm -hmm. by Sidi Hamete Benengeli. Yes. And so he commissions a translation from this teenage boy who's just reading the, the, the manuscript in exchange for rice. He pays for the translation of Don Quixote with rice and beans. Mm -hmm. um, and what we are reading is supposedly um, the young boy's translation of an Arabic oh, right. manuscript. Yeah, right. And this is a common trope, right? I'm, yes. Uh, how, can you tell us about any more? Indeed. <laughs> the, the found book trope is is a known trope in the Middle Ages also. Um, one of the most famous or infamous versions is um, Geoffrey of Monmouth, whom I mentioned. He, he wrote a book called The History of the Kings of Britain, which is notable because it is the first appearance at any length in writing of King Arthur. Um, and also of King Lear. So some great kings that we know and love uh, show up in this text uh, written down for the first time. But he claims that what he's doing 
is translating a most ancient book in the British tongue, in other words, in a Celtic language, into Latin. Um, and what he's actually doing is inventing sort of whole cloth, a, myth, a mythic history that will bridge the gap between when the Romans, well, it actually starts before the Romans left Britain, but he had, he had leeway because the Roman occupation of Britain was known about, but not in depth. So there was, a, it was sort of sketchily known about. So he, he rewrites sort of the Roman history of Britain and then fills in the gap between the arrival of the, the waves of German, Germanic settlement and the departure of Rome. So he takes this gap in history and stuffs it with, um, with fiction, really. He, per he claims it's history because he had the most ancient book in the British tongue. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you.